Did you ever ask yourself what are all those antennas that you see on electronic surveillance aircraft? Did you ever wonder what the operators inside an RC-135 are actually doing? These are closely guarded secrets that not even Otis can penetrate. Well, so if you would let me use some of my very particular set of abilities. The average electronic warfare YouTube video spends time describing the platform or how many are going to be produced and when, which is interesting, but it is like knowing that there will be girls at the party without knowing whether that girl you're chasing will be there too. The best videos go back to the Second World War and the use of chaffs, or they tell the story of Hypo at the Battle of Midway, uh, which is interesting, but only in an historical perspective. And flipping no one explains you why things are like they are today. So, let's start fixing this. This is just the first video on the subject, and if you will be so good to follow me, there will be many more going deeper and deeper into the subject. This subject is huge, so today we focus on SIGINT. Well, SIGINT is the abbreviation of Signal Intelligence and it is the analysis of the signals emitted by a non-cooperative player. It is a form of intelligence gathering, obviously, and here we are interested about the signal emitted in the electromagnetic spectrum by radio, radars, data links and other forms of communication. It is usually divided in ELINT, which stands for Electronic Intelligence, and COMINT, that stands for Communications Intelligence. ELINT focuses particularly on radars or positioning services while comment focuses on the communication related emissions. Assets like the RC-135 or the Russian Ilyushin 20M are flying examples we are particularly interested into, but SIGINT systems may be ground-based, fixed or mobile, ship-based and so on. Films and video games make us think that when there is an emission, everyone in the area can see it and understand what is going on. While this is very far from the truth or better, it takes an enormous effort and a colossal chain of events to get to that point. And even when the picture is available, there are always gaps and holes. Well, defining exactly what an electromagnetic wave is, is a job that is more suited to the physics lessons in high school or college. The mental image I think it is useful to have is that of a wave propagation as a spherical or directional perturbation moving out of the emitter at the speed of light. If you zoom in into the wave, you see that the perturbation is actually the oscillation of electric and magnetic fields according to a sinusoidal pattern. Why I'm telling you this? Because to use electromagnetic waves in practice, what you do is varying the wave characteristic features with a process that is called modulation. Modulation encodes information in a simple plane electromagnetic wave, which then becomes known as the carrier. You can modulate the amplitude, the frequency, the phase, and less frequently the polarization. Just to give you an idea, here is how the modulation may change the electromagnetic wave and how it may look graphically. As you can see, the wave changes shape and or frequency depending on the type of modulation. Why do we use modulation? Why don't we just send out the information as such? Why don't we broadcast directly what is usually called the baseband signal? Well, it is entirely a practicality and technology issue. Modulating a carrier wave with a baseband turns out does the job more efficiently. This is in a nutshell what is going on. Information is introduced by modulation in a wave and it is extracted or demodulated when it is received at the other end. Who receives it though is an entirely different matter. Since we're talking about signal intelligence, for the moment we don't care about the hardware and the software emitting the signal. But if you want to understand what is on board an electronic surveillance aircraft or what is inside a radar warning receiver on a fighter, we need to dig some more into the receiving end. So everybody knows intuitively what an antenna is. Basically, it is a piece of metal where when the electromagnetic wave hits, when the signal hits, electrons move, so variable voltage is produced. 
produced. Antennas come in all shapes and sizes depending on their purpose. Each geometry has characteristic parameters and these are used to determine the specific type of antenna which is the most suitable for a specific application. The most important parameters are efficiency gain and the beam width. The efficiency, as some may suppose, is just the ratio between the power delivered to the antenna, either receiving or emitting, and the power leaving the antenna, either radiated away or toward the radio circuitry. The higher, the better. Gain measures how much the antenna amplifies the emitted signal. The higher, the better. Know that gain in this case is sort of a deceptive term. Antennas do not really amplify signals. They are passive devices. They do not add energy. In fact, it is a bit of a tricky concept. So if we consider only the receiving function, the gain is rather an attenuation. Now, most antennas are directional. The gain pattern is called the beam width, even when there is no beam emitted because the antenna is just receiving. When receiving, the beam width interacts with the direction of the signal being received, which will be attenuated if it's not coming from the direction of maximum antenna gain. I hope it's clear. It is important to understand, though, that gain and efficiency are also dependent from the frequency. As a rule of thumb, the higher the frequency, the smaller is the wavelength, the smaller the antenna can be. This immediately states that you can't have a generic antenna and expect to use it for everything. One not the only one, but one of the reasons why electronic surveillance aircraft tend to be covered by forests of antennas is exactly this. However, consider that the choice of a specific type of antenna rather than something different may also be influenced by practical consideration, for example, size, weight, uh, structural and construction features, and so on. In the modern combat application that we generally cover, phased arrays are very popular for the control, flexibility, and the practicality of the form factor. These are used in many applications, for example, like the typical fighter radars working in the X-band, or even for surveillance radar in the lower frequency, uh, like the L-band on the E7 or on the Su-57. That's not the only possible solution because on the other hand, the Spectral Electronic Warfare Suite mounted on the Rafale is believed to make use of small spiral cavity antennas. And it is working as well. So we sort of understand which are the antennas being used in these systems, but the exact parameters of these antennas, the exact numbers are the secrets we were referring to at the beginning. Then, attached to the antenna, there are either the emitter or the receiver circuitry. And in this case, since we are focusing on SIGINT, we discuss the receivers. The receiver has the purpose of identifying a signal and extracting the modulation and make it available in a form that is useful for humans or uh, for other systems. Humans. In fact, every type of receiver is a compromise among various parameters. The sensitivity measures how small the signal can be before getting lost. Electrical noise. The selectivity measures the capability of discriminating among different signals. The frequency coverage, the bandwidth, measures the width of the band of frequencies that can be received. There are many more considerations connected with the choice of the technology of the receiver, and I'm definitely not going into the details. What matters, though, is to understand that for SIGINT purposes, even relatively old types have been in use till recently just because they cover wide bands. The super heterodyne receiver is pretty much the standard for many communication purposes, but, for example, specific tuned receivers may be used to identify specific signals. However, there is a pretty obvious elephant in the Oh God, oh God, he's still around, he's, sti he's still around. So the thing in the room is the digital receiver and the software defined radio. These are systems where part of the signal processing happens in the digital domain and it is implemented by software. Like everything digital and software driven, the main advantage is flexibility. 
functions that would have required complex physical electronics are implemented via software. <laughs> Update may just mean changing a chip on a PCB or rather than a memory module or rather than updating the software on a computer. These receivers emerged in the late 80s and became increasingly common since then. Modern systems are basically just digital. Various architectures are possible depending on where exactly the analog to digital conversion is happening. If computing power is not a problem, you may want to digitize the signal immediately downstream the antenna. However, this signal requires amplification and the signal to noise ratio of the amplifier may become an important factor degrading the, the quality of the received signal. The advantage though is that the whole received bandwidth is available for digital analysis. The software can identify a signal by on the digitized waveform, which is much easier and practical than turning a dial to go through the electromagnetic spectrum manually. Moreover, with a digital signal and a computer, it is much easier to control and coordinate a group of receivers, uh, present the data to the operators, do any kind of analysis, and so on. And this is important because now we know what to search and how to receive it, but then we need to discuss how to search it. So let's consider a drone equipped with SIGINT systems in flight somewhere. And to make an example that has no relation whatsoever with current events, let's say that it is flying in the middle of the Black Sea. The mission is to gather intelligence and keep the electronic order of battle of the area up to date. Just for the example's sake, let's suppose that we want to map the radars operating in the area. If this is the case, then we will have an interesting problem. So. Let's make a chart with frequency and time like this. The emissions of a civilian radar may be like this. The emissions of a relatively old air surveillance radar may be like this. The emissions of a Russian AWACS can be like this. And so on, you got the point. Now, the receivers on board of the drone can listen for radar emissions in this wide bandwidth. And when the drone, since it's following an orbit, must turn away, then it can't listen to the emissions for a while, because the antennas are pointed elsewhere. And while the drone is looking away, while well, these are the emissions of a PESA radar from a fighter, coming to shoot it down. So it is clear that a single receiver cannot cover all the frequencies all the time. The probability of intercept is a concept that measures how likely is a receiver to intercept a signal. Modern receivers are very, very efficient. They may have probability of intercepts very high, above 90%, but they're not perfect and they will probably never be. So the solution to this problem is to have more than one receiver, possibly with different antennas, facing in different directions. Even a very modern system like the F-35 has at least three sets of antennas dedicated to three different bands, and we could even five if you count the direction-finding antennas and the radar that can be used passively. So, conceptually, a SIGINT system is made of a few wideband receivers that are used to intercept the signals, sharing one or more antennas, and a few narrowband receivers that are tuned on the signals passed on by the wideband receivers, coupled with the hardware to execute the analysis. In the 70s and the 80s, all these activities were manual. There was an operator adjusting dials, moving switches to direct signals to components, and there was a lot of hardware doing the signal analysis and the visualization. This is what all the operators on the RC-135 were doing, and to some extent, they still are because the aircraft now is quite old. With the progressive digitization, more and more of these tasks are done in the digital domain with less and less operator intervention, but this is a computationally resource-intensive job. And in fact, you have situations like on the F-35 where there is a system that prioritizes the tracks to be analyzed because not all the tracks can be analyzed at the same time. The computational capability is not sufficient.
Now we are capable of detecting the signals and tune on them for analysis. Then, what kind of parameters are we going to measure? This is extremely important because the electronic signature of a radar is determined by these parameters. These parameters are then included in the threat libraries and they're used on fighters, combat aircraft and other assets to identify the potential threats. The general principle for the analysis is that the easiest parts are done first because they're quicker and they start telling part of the story. Staying in our radar example, you start with the parameters that can be determined with one pulse, then you move on to the parameters that require two pulses, and so on. So the first parameter is the carrier frequency. This is determined when the signal is detected and it is the basic information to start the analysis. It seems very easy, but here you can see that a radar capable of quickly hopping frequency is already making the apparent easiest job, well, very difficult. Then, from a single pulse, it is possible to determine the pulse width. Notice that width in this case means duration. Depending on the radar type, this could not be a constant, but then you will have a variation pattern and that will be part of the electronic signature. From a single pulse is also possible to determine the pulse amplitude, which is related to the radar emitted power, and it will be important later for determining the beam width. When the second pulse is received, it is then possible to determine the pulse interval. This is also known as pulse repetition frequency, and every radar can vary it because it influences the capability of detecting a target. Now, let's suppose that the radar is just scanning. While the antenna is moving, we will receive a group of pulses whose amplitude is determined by the antenna beam width, which then can be measured and calculated in this way. Now, let's suppose that the radar is just scanning. While the antenna is moving, we will receive a group of pulses whose amplitude is determined by the antenna beam width. If the antenna is static, like it happens for phased arrays, usually there still is a scan pattern that can be used for this analysis. And then when the beam comes back after a rotation or after having gone through the scan pattern, uh, it's the time when we can infer information about the scan pattern itself. And finally, now that we have a good sample of pulses, we can analyze the signal modulation and the waveforms that the radar uses. These do influence the radar performance and they have various uses that is important to know to understand the radar capabilities. Put all this together and you have a pretty neat electronic signature that can be used in practice. However, to determine the opponent's electronic order of battle, there is still the emitter location that is missing, but I stop here. And I stop here because this was supposed to be a quick video between two long ones, but the script is already nine pages long. Just allow me for a note before leaving. Rereading the script, I realized that I gave a pretty straightforward description. This video is a drastic simplification that explains at best the problems we are dealing with. So please don't quit your job to find a new position in the electronic warfare industry, at least for now. So thank you very much for making this far into the video. I really appreciate that. I consider a honor and a privilege having had your time. If you enjoyed the video, please do the usual YouTube stuff. Subscribe, like this or dislike, and hit the bell. And a big thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member. You guys are absolutely fundamental for this operation. And for those who could consider supporting the channel, you will have access to some behind the scene videos, but also to material that I prepare for the videos, uh, scripts, presentations, and so on. I also have to thank you all the people who are donating one off. So this is the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.